Would you like to know the three most important things you can do to help you live a longer, healthier, and more active life? Well, in this video, we're gonna tell you what those three things are, and we're gonna dive into the science about why they work. Now, even though one of these items might be more important than the others, let's start with the one that I think might be the easiest one to accomplish. Yep, that's right, sleep. Sleep is often one of the first things to go when people feel pressed for time. A lot of us think sleep is a luxury and think that we can get more accomplished if we sleep less. People often overlook the potential long-term health consequences of insufficient sleep and how being tired impacts our productivity. Many of the costs of poor sleep go unnoticed. Medical conditions such as obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease develop over a long period of time and there are a number of other factors that contribute to these conditions. But according to an article published by the Harvard Medical School, insufficient sleep has been linked to these and other health problems and is considered an important risk factor. And the potential adverse health effects caused by a lack of rest can add up to a lowered life expectancy and a reduced day-to-day -day well-being. An analysis of data from three separate studies suggests that sleeping five or fewer hours per night may increase mortality risk, that's the risk of dying, by as much as 15%. And while sleeping well is no guarantee of good health, it does help to maintain many vital functions. One of the most important of these functions may be to provide cells and tissues with the opportunity to recover from the wear and tear of daily life. Major restorative functions in the body such as tissue repair, muscle growth, and protein synthesis occur almost exclusively during sleep. The science is a long way from complete regarding how sleep impacts our health, but until we know more, sleep experts say there is ample evidence that shows that when people get the sleep they need, they will not only feel better, but will also increase their odds of living healthier, more productive lives. Okay, so let's talk about exercise. Scientists have known for a long time that physical exercise is well connected to the aging process. Exercise affects us at a molecular and cellular level and causes changes over a long period of time. And a lack of it can lead to the deterioration of functions that are important to keeping a human body alive and healthy. Aging is a physiological process that's characterized by a progressive decline of biological functions and an increase in destructive processes in cells and organs. So how much exercise do we need and what type of exercise is best? A study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2018 recommends that adults engage in at least 150 to 300 minutes per week of moderate exercise and 75 to 150 minutes each week of vigorous movement or an equivalent combination of both intensities. But it turns out that if adults do more than the recommended amount, it can help them live longer. Moderate physical activity is defined as walking, weightlifting, and other lower intensity exercises. And vigorous exercise is defined as activities like running, bicycling, and swimming. The study found that those who worked out two to four times beyond the minimum physical activity recommendations had a lower risk of death from cardiovascular disease. Those who worked out two to four times above the moderate physical activity recommendations, which is about 300 to 600 minutes each week, saw the most benefit. Participants had a 26% to 31% lower all-cause mortality, while 28% to 38% had a lower cardiovascular mortality. On top of that, 25% to 27% experienced lower non-cardiovascular mortality. In other words, it took them longer to get sick and die. <laughs> Some of the reasons that exercise helped these people in the study live longer are that exercise increases fat oxidation, it increases your metabolism, and it results in adaptations and improvements in the cardiovascular system. Also, regular exercise improves the quality of sleep and can improve cognitive performance. Regular physical exercise can also cause many other effects that can affect positive aging and health, like increased strength and agility. And now let's take a look at the third piece of the anti-aging puzzle, and this may be the most important one, diet. What we eat, how much we eat, and how often we eat are all important when it comes to living longer. So first, let's talk about how often we eat. 
Calorie restriction has been shown to increase lifespan in pretty much every study ever conducted on all types of animals. One way to achieve calorie restriction is with intermittent fasting. When we mention fasting, you might have images of a starvation diet. For this video, we'll define intermittent fasting as a practice of eating normally, but only within an eight hour window each day. Besides resulting in calorie restriction, intermittent fasting has some other interesting health benefits. During fasting, cells undergo adaptive stress, which activates different pathways in the body, resulting in a range of effects, including increased production of antioxidants, DNA repair, autophagy, which is the removal of damaged or dead cells, and decreased inflammation. And all of those things have a positive impact on longevity. Intermittent fasting is a relatively easy way to reduce calories. It's safe for pretty much everyone. And it is a practice you can easily use every day for the rest of your life. Doing just this one activity will simplify both how often you eat and how much. Now let's talk about what you eat. There are arguments made all over the internet for going strictly vegan or strictly meat or keto or paleo and lots of others. The folks promoting these diets disagree with each other on lots of different things. But one place where they all seem to agree is that we need to do our best to eliminate processed foods from our diets. The obesity epidemic we see in the world has a direct correlation to the increase in processed oils, sweeteners, and other foods that have become a major part of what is on our grocery store shelves. A lot of these foods came about because of incomplete science that determined that saturated fats cause heart disease. According to articles published by the Harvard Medical School and others, recent focus on an old study called the Minnesota Coronary Experiment has helped us realize that we may have been wrong about that. And if that's the case, butter is probably way better for you than margarine. So what about protein? Well, we need to consume enough complete protein in order to build and maintain muscle. Now let's listen to a couple of doctors talk about how much we need and where we should get it. I'm gonna tell you about protein and as Dr. Bickman mentioned this morning, protein is a building nutrient. When we think about skeletal muscle, a way of thinking about it is that it's like a brick wall. We need to put bricks into the wall and we need to take bricks out of the wall to keep it healthy, to keep it going. Protein is a nutrient that builds muscle. As we age, we lose muscle. And some supplements can also help build muscle. The output that we're looking for, however, when we're younger is to grow muscle. I and mean, as we age, the output that we'd really like to see is that our muscle not decline as much, is that the increases in muscle protein synthesis and new bricks going into the wall and new muscle being made is long lasting. And exercise potentiates that effect. A question that we asked a few years ago was what was an optimal amount of protein to feed somebody in a situation to get their muscle to grow? So the message from this study was that 20 grams of protein were optimal to stimulate protein synthesis, or about a quarter gram per kilo. Now the interesting part is this is how it works in young people. Young people who are very active, protein, does a great job. So what changes then in older people? Older people need more protein to get the same stimulation of muscle protein synthesis. A question that we asked ourselves was if protein is important, is it all of the protein or is it just one single or a few amino acids? And the interesting answer when you look at the literature and look at some of the studies that we've performed is that it really comes down to a single amino acid and that's leucine. Leucine is a branch chain amino acid, the concentration of which is important to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. Finally, I'd like to tell you something about what protein will not do. We probably have heard more than once that proteins will cause our bones to get softer, and that's not true. Bone is actually almost 50% in terms of its content, 
protein. It's made up of collagen. So it's not just calcium. It's not a stick of chalk. So we need protein for bones. And in fact, protein is needed for optimal bone health. But probably the biggest myth that you would have heard around protein is that it will cause your kidneys to fail. It puts strain on your kidneys and leads to kidney failure. I'm here to tell you today that that is untrue. The more healthy muscle mass you have, the research is clear, the greater your survivability against nearly every disease. That is very rare to be able to say in medicine. We also know that the primary ways to support muscle health are resistance exercise and dietary protein. 23% of adults are meeting their exercise requirements. 23%. We know that as individuals age, muscle mass, strength, decline. Resistance exercise offers us the closest thing to the fountain of youth that we have. We know that resistance exercise and dietary protein act synergistically to protect muscle health. So, did you know that 40% of women over the age of 65 don't meet their average, the daily requirements for protein? I recommend all my patients have 40 grams of high quality protein at that first and last meal of the day. Anything below that amount does not protect muscle in the same way. Muscle is made from protein. And I recommend high quality protein, which include lean meats, chicken, fish, eggs, and dairy. Now, you're probably hearing the narrative that we should cut back on our high quality protein. The unintended consequences of this will be devastating. It is possible to get enough protein on a vegan diet, but it can't be done without supplementation. Our bodies require vitamin B12, which is only available in nature from animal products in order to survive. And typically, plant proteins don't contain all of the essential amino acids our bodies need to support healthy muscle. So if you choose to go vegan, plan on supplementing in order to optimize your health. We're all different when it comes to how food affects us. For each of us, there are certain foods that help us thrive, and then there are others that cause problems. One good way to find out what's best for your own body is to try an elimination diet. Start with a 24 hour or longer water only fast in order to give your system a chance to clean out and reset. Then, as you begin eating again, introduce only one or two foods at a time and give yourself a chance to observe how they make you feel. If you notice reactions like a stuffy nose or maybe bloating, for example, you may want to eliminate those foods from your diet and try others that don't cause reactions. So there you have it, three basic areas of life that you can control. And if you give them the attention they deserve, these three things can be profoundly beneficial to your longevity and health. Thanks for watching.